Hello, welcome to Business Success Talk. I'm Daniel Ortiz, and today my guest is entrepreneur, realtor, and art collector, Chris Webster. Chris, welcome to our program. Thank you, Daniel. It's wonderful to be here with you. I'm glad to have you here because you're uh, a quintessential entrepreneur, and this show is all about business and primarily entrepreneurship, and you have a lot of different segments to your business, and your journey is pretty fascinating when, from when you started to where you are now. Uh, before we get into that, though, Chris, uh, tell us, what is your American dream and what does it mean to you? Daniel, my American dream was to be able to spend time with extraordinary people in the world's most beautiful places. And I feel like that ever since I graduated from college, that's, I've been very fortunate to be able to do just that. And that's led me down a lot of different paths to pursue different uh, opportunities in business. And they, as we know from this point, it's mostly been seated in the real estate and art worlds, and I've just never looked back as having a phenomenal opportunity to pursue that dream. Okay, so uh, one of the th things that I know about your story and your journey, you start off in North Carolina, is that right? Correct. Okay, and you come back to, or not come back, but uh, went to Colorado for a short stint. Right. And then settled in beautiful Santa Fe, New Mexico. I was attracted to the Rocky Mountain lifestyle, and it's a wonderful outdoor experience to enjoy the majesty of all the natural world, as well as to, for me, to learn about the history of the region and the area, the indigenous people, the times of Spanish exploration and the westward movements and things that have led us to today that I do very little about growing mm -hmm. up in North Carolina. Okay, and you have actually in, in your possession some very, eight or some very, but one in particular important historical document which we'll get into uh, in a minute. But uh, tell us about the journey when you started uh, you said you wanted to live in different beautiful locations, so why Santa Fe and why? how did you get into the real estate business? Basically, when I first came to Santa Fe, it was a result of having seen in Colorado fabulous Native American Indian artifacts and Western paintings dis displaying the beauty of the American West. Mm -hmm. And the people I spoke with told me to learn more and to see more, I should come to Santa Fe where museums, galleries, collectors were. So when I drove into this town, I was expecting those things and certainly found them in abundance, mm -hmm. but I had not really been prepared adequately for the adobe architecture and the just sensual ethereal character that it has. And I just was totally mesmerized and fell in love at first sight basically with Santa Fe and decided to make this my home. And as an art dealer, while traveling and dealing with museums and collectors in you know, different regions of this country and out of the country as well, and told people I was from Santa Fe. They all said how much they loved this town, wanted to move here, buy a second home here, retire here. Mm -hmm. And so in the mid-70s, I got a real estate broker's license and merged a real estate brokerage operation with my art investment company. Okay, so, and you actually uh, brought to Santa Fe a, an iconic uh, brand in real estate, I guess it was new at the time, and that which is Sotheby's, is that right? Tell us about that story. Well, basically, as I was in real estate and had relationships with the parent company, Sotheby's Holdings and the Sotheby's Auction House in New York and London and elsewhere, they also decided to open a real estate company in 1976, Sotheby's International Realty. And so based on relationships I had within the company, I was able to parlay that into having the exclusive affiliation for New Mexico when they started to expand their real estate activities outside of Manhattan and Long Island and Palm Beach, which was where their first operations were established. And as that occurred, I also had requests from people in Mexico to represent their properties for sale, and so subsequently, I added the country of Mexico as a territory of which I had the exclusive affiliation and established offices throughout that country, representing, again, properties under Sotheby's International Realty's brand. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious, uh, people from back east, you know, we all are uh, products of our environment. So I know, in, in, uh, it's kind of a joke, you know, people in, like in New York, they see this as flyover country, right? They go, <laughs> and it's it, it's very especially in New York. It's very it's a, you know it's a hub of the world. I mean it's a, the financial capital of the world. I'm just curious when when you brought the idea to open up a Sotheby's in Santa Fe, New Mexico. What was the reaction? Well, the reaction was they wanted to add the type of boutique market that Santa Fe was. So they were the, aware of the city and, and yes. the, the business. Santa Fe's, I think, been well known to people that are certainly involved in the art world mm -hmm. and That's the true. world of history. Right. And Santa Fe wasn't alone. I mean, the other boutique markets that they were anxious to uh, have a presence in included other Rocky Mountain communities to the north in Aspen, mm -hmm. in Telluride, in Jackson, Wyoming, okay. etc. Right. Right. So that was an affiliate network that this company and. I felt honored that I had the opportunity to 
participate with the leadership of Sotheby's International Realty in helping them expand their brand into different parts of the world and growing the company and identifying other markets where the brand would be well received and capable of delivering the type of service, which is what it really boils down to. Mm -hmm. In the real estate business, I'm providing a service of how to understand real property, its laws, and the all the things that pertain to the property and the only basic differentiation from my standpoint is that with lots of commonalities but that buyers have dreams and sellers have goals and so in working with buyers it's in the dream fulfillment business of helping them find their dream home or property that they're out to uh, identify a seller basically wants to or needs to sell a property they have the goal of selling that property and the sooner and the more expeditiously and accomplishing their goals is the fulfillment of that particular campaign. So Sotheby's as a real estate company is providing these services to the buyers and sellers of properties on a now global basis with so many different you know, offices and associates worldwide. Okay, all right. So let's talk about the art business. You, what, what I hear you saying, you were actually in the art business as well? Correct, that was start? what I really started with, okay. Daniel, was um, I was just, now, did you, did you, in college, in school, did you study art, or are you? I was a history major at Duke University, mm -hmm. and I grew up in a family that uh, had had lots of involvements with the art community. My parents, grandparents were supporters of the art museum and art societies in North Carolina, and I had had the great fortune in growing up to have traveled and been able to have gone to most of the major museums in this country as well as Western Europe before I was 20 years old. And it just was a subliminal uh, impact that the art, the culture, whether it be museums or cathedrals or palaces or whatever the case was, and travel to be able to absorb that cultural dimension added to my other experiences which involve sports and education and things that mm -hmm. you do as a youth and through your adolescence into adulthood. Okay. So what did, what did you start collecting and selling? How did the, how when did I, you get started? I had a chance to go back to North Carolina to visit family and friends, and many of whom were major art collectors or patrons, and I borrowed material from uh, a few art dealers that were willing to lend me pieces to go show to certain collectors and museums, and that started with a small corpus of items that then people were interested in buying, and they did, and I had a small grub stake that I had amassed that I was able to buy a few pieces independently and then through buying, selling, and trading continued to grow that collection and to grow the client base of museums and collectors that I was able to deal with and understanding a person's interests. You could tell me that you have a specific interest in a type of either a category very broad or very specific, and I would remember what you're looking for and go in search of trying to find the types of things that I would think that you would find of interest and recontact you and say, I found this, I found that, and it just continued to grow and parlay and go from there. Okay, so do you specialize in a certain type of arts or genre, or I don't know if they call it genre, or, or type I, of I describe what, or I describe that what gives me the greatest, um, you know, just, Passion, what I'm passionate about most is the confluence of the primitive and the contemporary. And there was a show at the Modern Art Museum in New York uh, several decades ago that was called Primitivism in the 20th Century. It talked about the influence that indigenous tribal art from African masks or from South Pacific or from the southwestern United States, masks, wood carvings, influenced very important artists during the late 19th, early 20th century. And in our gallery on the plaza in Santa Fe, we have repetitive shows over every couple of months of representing different artists that are either involved in photography or painting or sculpture, and we have a collection of the more primitive types of things from prehistoric and historic times, Spanish colonial furniture in combination with Knoll International Furniture, which is probably the finest contemporary furniture company in the world. I used to be their representative for the state of New Mexico. So it's these blending of the primitive and the older objects with those that are new and how the geometry, the symbolism, the, uh, the, the tactile nature of uh, a textile or something that's sculptural that has the sense of feel to it. To me, it's sensual bombardment when you're talking about the arts because the arts are not just visual arts, there's performing arts, mm -hmm. there's spiritual arts, there's cooking arts, there's all sorts of things that Santa Fe is a, a center for so many of these types of activities and people come to Santa Fe because of the arts, which for me, by being in the center of town in La Plaza, I just have the opportunity to have the world coming through that particular location on a regular basis. 
in the La Fonda Hotel, they say the world comes through the lobby of the La Fonda <laughs> Hotel. So, uh, yeah. Well, Santa Fe is what, the third largest art market in the, in the U.S., is that yeah, right? Yeah, they've right. had studies that show that behind New York and or L.A. and certainly Paris Cars on a global volume. basis, mm -hmm. it, for a town of 80-some thousand people, it's truly remarkable right. as to how much emphasis and attractiveness. We're up to about two million visitors a year that come to Santa Fe, yeah. and I'm convinced that the vast majority of those are influenced and want to come here because of lifestyle and because of the arts. Right, and don't forget the food. Well, that's part <laughs> of the lifestyle. <laughs> okay, you're right, you're right. Well, you know, in Santa Fe, um, you know, and I grew up here, so it, this is this is n common to me. I mean, that the, but every, they say everything in Santa Fe is art. You know, you have your people's uh, gates in the front, uh, front yard is, right. is art, right? right? You know, the turquoise gates. Uh, Levi jackets, you know, we start. I don't know if it started here, but people started drawing or put the symbols on the back and beads and even tennis shoes. Sure. You know, so everything here is art. Well, a fashion icon such as Ralph Lauren was certainly pleased by and influenced to enter into a lot of his fashion design and collections styles that were emanating from here. Is and that right? Yes, over the Mexico and the Southwest. Uh -huh. well, interesting, interesting. So let's segue into um, a particular topic which I'm really fascinated with, and of course I'm producing a documentary film about Hispanic culture and Hispanics in the Southwest. But let's talk, go to the very, very beginning of the Spanish uh, colonization, exploration of the New World. Um, and so going back, we know that in history, children are taught that in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Exactly. And the next week, the, uh, the pilgrims landed on the Mayflower, uh, sailed on the Mayflower and landed at Plymouth Rock. But over a decade, actually 100 years before that, the Spanish were here. That's correct. Right? The and Spanish first came into New Mexico in the 1530s. And that led to a series of events of where Cabeza de Vaca was shipwrecked in some hurricanes off the Gulf Coast. Mm -hmm. And he, among three other survivors, lived among and with Native American indigenous people and gradually working their way back to Spanish outposts in Mexico. They had heard stories of the seven cities of gold, Cibola, Tigue, Quiragua, etc. And the king was intrigued on wanting to continue the exploration after the results that they had discovered when they had first gone into what today is Mexico and then subsequently Peru right. and discovered the cultures in their city centers of Tenochtitlan, which is today's Mexico City, and the Inca Empire in and around Cusco and the Andes and down to the coastal areas. Right. So the So the Incas were known renowned for the silver predominantly. Silver and gold as was prevalent in both Mexican culture and in Peruvian mm -hmm. culture, as well as jade, and mm -hmm. there were so many things of refinement as far as their clothing, their artistry, their architecture and buildings, working with stone, that were just masterpieces unlike things that had ever been seen before, right, right. and still to this day revered for their extraordinary accomplishment. Right. So uh, tell us about the, the little bit about the history. So Cabeza de Vaca, he heard stories of seven cities of gold, and of course, after having the uh, experience with the Aztecs and with the Incas, that, I mean, there, there would be no reason to believe, not to believe these That's stories. That's correct. So, but do you think these were fables, or what did these seven cities come from? Uh, there's one theory that says that they just wanted to get the Spanish out, so they made up a story. <laughs> there's gold up in the It's they, not here, it must be there. So, yeah. what, what, what's your well, take on that? Y you know, the succession of those explorations, the next expedition was actually led by a man of the cloth, a monk whose name was Fray Marco de Niza. And it was a smaller expedition, and because the king wanted to try and pursue what these rumors had led to, he came north and ultimately came only as far as Hibaku, which was part of the Zuni Pueblo in southwestern New Mexico, mm -hmm. and or west central New Mexico. But Esteban was a, um, was a Moorish man that had been one of the survivors with Cabeza de Vaca, and he came along with uh, Fray Marco de Niza, having just come from this part of the world, he wanted to be able to be a scout. And unfortunately, he was killed by the Zuni Pueblo uh, people when he was there, and causing, therefore, Fray Marco de Niza to decide to abort the mission. But he had actually looked upon the adobe buildings and stone at Hiwaku in the late afternoon sunset and had the golden appearance that allowed him to go and return to say he had seen the seven cities mm -hmm. of gold which really created a much more substantive um, first-person accounting of what was here that caused a great demand to have the discovery rights to this part of the world. And so 
Coronado was who was ultimately awarded those discovery rights as is evidenced in the letter that I was able to acquire about 24 years ago. And it, in it, the King of Spain, Charles, tells Coronado to come north. And I know that you have the actual language as it's translated from right. the Spanish right. language document. Right. But that was that what led to the Coronado expedition, which took place in the late 1530s, early 1540s. So this is a little bit of the history that's not well known. See, the, the Spanish, when they explored the, the north in the area, they just didn't hop on a horse and, and take off. They had to have permission or at least um, maybe even sponsorship from the Spanish crown, didn't they? They did. They did indeed. And that's what this letter... And there was, and there, as far as uh, our, in our previous conversation, there was actually some some competition. There was. To, to Cortez, explore. who had been a part of uh, everything in Tenochtitlan in mm -hmm. Mexico, he actually was interested in trying to pursue this and felt that no one really understood the geography of our country that well at that point in time. Mm -hmm. And in Cortez's case, he felt that he could go to Acapulco, build a fleet of some ships and sail north and march east and arrive at these places. Mm -hmm. De Soto in Florida had inherited the discovery rights that had originally been granted to Ponce de Leon and it was Florida and all the lands attached there too. And De Soto felt so the discovery that, rights actually could be inherited. Yes, or, or passed on in some fashion. Uh -huh. I don't know the exact uh, procedures and protocols that mm -hmm. were involved by the Crown and the members of the Spanish uh, military and mm -hmm people that were leading these expeditions, right. but De Soto felt that he could march north and west and get into this territory. And interestingly enough, when Coronado was further east from here in the Kansas area, De Soto was just a few hundred miles to his southeast as he was trying to lead his own expedition in search of the same thing. Mm -hmm. But it was the letter from the king that ultimately was the written document that uh, pointed basically Coronado to be the one that would have these discovery rights. So I happen to have, we have a, we'll show the image of the actual document which right. on the screen here, but let me so, uh, read something that I thought was fascinating. So um, just full disclosure, so I'm, uh, as you know, I'm producing a documentary film, Hispanic America, The Untold Story. This is part of the untold story. I know, we've had great conversations about your project, which I totally admire and respect what you're doing. Thank you, thank you. And one of the, the fascinating things that I've, um, discovered is there is there's a distinction between history and narrative okay so for example you know that um, um, George Washington defeated the British that's that's history but there's a certain narrative uh, you know and sometimes history gets expanded <laughs> depending on who tells the story right one of the uh, things that I'm uh, creating in, in the uh, or uh, uh, pursuing in the documentary film is the narrative that the Spanish came and they did uh, conquer the natives, but they also traded with the natives. They also intermarried with the natives. Exactly. The Spanish were actually uh, allowed to marry 500 years before it was even allowed in, in, in the Americas. It was in like 1920s when um, it was became legal to intermarry between um, different races. But here's here's something I found fascinating about that letter with um, Coronado. So this is the, the king to Francisco Vasquez de Coronado in Madrid. July 11th, 1540, the king, Francisco Vasquez de Coronado, our governor and captain general of the province of New Galicia in New Spain. We have seen your letter of the 15th of July of last year, 1539, in which you have given us an account of the state of affairs in that province and of the work you have done to bring peace to its natives who have revolted. For this, I thank you and hold it as a service to me as well as the care you have taken and are taking in the pacification of the people of the province, and also your benevolent treatment of the natives who live there, which we enjoin you to continue. Yes. So there was not a conscious effort to conquer and subjugate and enslave the natives. And yes, things happen as they do in, in all wars, but the, the, these were Catholic men who and we know that Queen Isabella, her uh, primary motive in, in supporting the expeditions was to spread Christianity, right? That, exactly. That was one of the twofold mission, basically, of the whole exploration into the New World, was to further the sovereignty of the crown of the Spanish Empire, as well as the dominion of the Roman Catholic, Holy Catholic Church. Right. So you tell us about this document, you, uh, the historical significance as far as its uniqueness in the, as far as historical documents in the United States. Basically, Daniel, uh, there's several things that 
come about that are remarkable. First of all, that it survives to this day, given the time period that it was written. And the interesting thing is that this letter is actually an exact copy of the original letter that was written in Seville, at Spain, and signed by the Council of the Indies, the governing body. And at the very top of the letter, it says El Rey, the king. Mm -hmm. And it's in the king's voice, but signed by the Council of the Indies, his governing body, and sent to Coronado in Mexico, where he lived with his wife and was under the dominion of the viceroy of the whole Audencia for the Spanish crown and its governmental representation with um, for, uh, Mendoza was the viceroy of the Spanish government representing the crown in this new world. So Coronado was one of his favorite choices to be able to have these discovery rights once these stories had been circulating and the desire was to send a major expedition to the north having again the history of what had happened in Mexico and in Peru with the cultures that they were able to find and their extraordinary accomplishments. So this was written by the head scribe of the Audencia, Antonio de Tercius, and I have had the benefit of counsel from a man and his wife, Richard and Shirley Flint, who are considered to be among the world's leading scholars on Coronado and 16th century Spanish documents. And the interesting thing about this letter that is in my possession that I acquired 24 years ago is the fact that it is written on the paper that was the official paper of the Audencia in Mexico. So it's a new world document as being distinctly separate and different from an old world document of which there are tens of thousands of old world documents that emanated from Spain. Mm -hmm. But from this time period and to be able to find new world documents, they are few and far between. There's several that are associated again with Ponce de Leon in Florida, but as far as New Mexico, now a part of the United States after it was a territory, and the fact that a courier took this letter from Mexico City and delivered it to Coronado in the Pueblo outside of Albuquerque near Bernalillo that he was encamped in for a winter campaign between here and Santa, between Santa Fe and Albuquerque. And so it was a document actually delivered to him while he was encamped in New Mexico. So the ties to New Mexico history and to the history of the United States, it's the earliest known document delivered as such, and by obviously its content as to what it describes in authorizing Coronado and with the directives, as you just read some of, from the king to him mm -hmm. and to how to conduct his expedition and the territories and the people that he would encounter and discover, I find just to be a remarkable element that we could have the opportunity to look at and digest today. So how is uh, this document that predates the the, the uh, Declaration of Independence by about 200 years. Yes. How, do you, how does he you keep it intact? I mean, what's, what condition is it in and where is it now? It's in my possession. In, well, it's actually in a vault in storage for protection and security. But um, How is it preserved after all this time? Basically, it's a piece of paper that is protected in between uh, the proper types of materials of a plastic uh, archival that allows its transparency so that you can actually see it by holding it and it's in container but you can actually take the paper out of its container for personal up close examination mm -hmm. which on occasions have been done by professional experts mm -hmm. but the um, I, I, I guess I lost another part of your question, but I mean, that's the condition that it's in, it's phenomenal condition. Oh, I'm, I'm, but I'm, I'm, for over the 300 years, of, I'm sorry. Yeah. What I surmise, and this is only what anyone can do, is that having been delivered to Coronado's wife, the letter that came from Spain, signed by the Council of the Indies, mm -hmm. delivered by Mendoza, mm -hmm. the viceroy, mm -hmm. who then directed the scribe Antonio de Tercius to pen the copy that was folded twice, put into a courier's pouch, and delivered to Coronado when he was encamped on the banks of the Rio Grande. Mm -hmm. I would say that the um, letter was probably connected back with the letter that had come from Spain when Coronado returned to Mexico. Mm -hmm. And it was, there's some holes on the side that are part of where in those days letters uh, documents of importance were stitched into a book that would maybe be an inch, inch and a half or so thick, and mm -hmm. then they would wrap up that book and start a new book with new documents as they went. Mm -hmm. And then it remained in the contents of the Coronado family for, I'm sure, a substantial time period. This mm -hmm. letter 
both letters basically um, arose through an obscure British auction house, at which time they were acquired by a collector in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And with advice and counsel that he received, and it's really sort of an interesting uh, faux pas, the letter that I possess was misattributed as being a manuscript draft of the copy that was signed by the Council of the Indies and sent from Seville to Mexico City. But upon showing the document that I have to Richard and Shirley Flint, who knows the handwriting of Antonio de Tercius that knew the watermark of the paper of the Audencia for Mexico City, mm -hmm. said this is no manuscript draft. Richard specifically said this is an original document wow. written by the head scribe of the Audencia in Mexico City and therefore is a new world document which there are so few known to still remain and exist mm -hmm. and for it to have been further been delivered by courier into Coronado's hands in New Mexico just adds the other sort of icing on the cake of the intrigue of what was happening at that particular moment in time. Right. And I know, uh, being of Spanish heritage, that the Spanish took meticulous records of virtually everything. When there was an expedition, they would know how many uh, cows and chickens and uh, they had uh, swords and they would describe the individual and he was a short stature or a high stature or he had a scar and his neighbors, I mean, they right. meticulous records. And so, um, what? where do you see this document being ultimately? It's your possession, you, you've you mentioned that you're basically, you've just have been a caretaker of it, you know, the one right. of a long line of caretakers. And that's so, all that any of us can be, is just temporary custodians, custodians. of things that come into our yeah. hands and possession. But Daniel, I've had a really phenomenal journey over the last 24 years with this letter where I was able to go and visit major museums and cultural institutions, libraries, universities, here in this country as well as in Spain. Well, we have, we have a, a photo of you with the king, of, well, the then prince of Spain was now the king of Spain. Exactly, he was in Santa Fe for the 400th anniversary and I had the great pleasure and opportunity to have lunch with him when he was here. And it's his many great grandfathers that was there in Valladolid, Spain mm -hmm. in 1528, welcoming Cortes back with indigenous people from the New World that the people in Spain and the Western European community at large were seeing for the first time, their treasures and things that were brought back by Cortez. Right. But I see the letter ultimately ending up in an important cultural institution, the Library of Congress, the Smithsonian, other places in Spain, the Museum of the Americas, the Spanish Archives, have all expressed interest as far as in knowing about this letter having been discovered and found that wasn't destroyed or what have you, right. and to be able to recognize the importance of preserving it. And to me personally, living in Santa Fe and the opportunity that may present itself as far as to see that it would come even to our history museum would be a pursuit that I would like to pursue further. And um, ultimately, just it'll find its place at the right time. Things happen at the right time for the right reason. Right, right. One of the fascinating things that I, I as reading the translation is how eloquently they spoke Yes. at, at that time. And you know, we, even the, the, um, the writing, the cursive, I guess you'd call it, it was, everything was so elegant uh, during that time. It was a different, different time, different age. It was oh. indeed. It's been interesting for me to take a personal journey and a deep dive into that particular time period and to learn and discover all the things that I have in the process. Right, right. So what's next for Christopher Webster Real Estate and, and Art Collector? Uh, what's next? Basically, uh, the continuance of things that we're doing, I've had the opportunity to get into publishing with leading estates of the world and representing in that fashion some of the world's most extraordinary residential properties and the art world. We're continuing through Webster Collection, our gallery on the plaza, to showcase and represent artists and their work and to stimulate dialogue in Santa Fe with events and activities, which we've done on occasion. I think that there's such an appreciative audience in Santa Fe that wants to talk about the basic key topics that bring experience and education surrounding health and wellness, history and culture, art and science, uh, all the recreational and lifestyle types of attributes where this town to me has a lifestyle uh, quotient that it offers to its citizens and visitors alike, mm -hmm. all of whom are extraordinary and the opportunity for us to live here, we are so fortunate. I, don't, I know of no place better. Great, great. Well, Chris, uh, time went fast, and uh, I want to thank you for being a guest on our show and congratulate you on, on the work that you've done and what you've done for the community as well, which we really didn't get a, a chance to talk about. So thank you for, for uh, being a guest, and I want to thank our audience for joining us on this edition of Business Success Talk. Thank you, Daniel, very much.